advise anyone to be one in any story on these controversies. Well, I'm starting to wonder about that. The Inspector General recently concluded in another report that former Deputy Director McCabe improperly authorized media leaks to make himself look good. Then he lied about it multiple times, both under oath and to Mr. Coleman. Mr. McCabe denies that, and his lawyers claim that there are emails with Mr. Comey that would uh, vind uh, vindicate him. The FBI hasn't provided any such emails, and the Inspector General's report doesn't mention any. Neither man could agree to come here and explain it to the committee. Yeah, yeah. Whatever happened, it is a sad state of affairs for the former top two employees and officials at the FBI to be in a swearing contest over press leaks. Justice should be blind. Law enforcement needs to ignore politics, follow the facts, and embrace oversight as a way to improve. The Inspector Justice General's report ought to be a law step, really step one, politics. in the right direction. But consequences must follow. Senator Feinstein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. Inspector General Horowitz, thank you for the hard work that you and your staff has done. This is a very big report. I think the largest I've seen in at least two decades. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you and from Director Ray. After an 18 month investigation that included review of more than 1.2 million documents and interviews with more than 100 witnesses, the Inspector General found no evidence of political bias in the FBI's investigation of Secretary Clinton or in the decision not to pursue criminal charges. As the report says, the IG, quote, did not find documentary or testimonial evidence that improper considerations, including political bias, directly affecting the specific investigative decisions we reviewed. The IG also found no evidence that the conclusions by the prosecutors were affected by bias or other improper considerations. Rather, we determined that they were based on the prosecutor's assessment of the facts, the law, and past department practice, well as it should be. The Inspector General also concluded that Director Comey violated Department of Justice policies when he spoke publicly and informed Congress about the investigation. On July 5th, 2016, four months before the election, Mr. Comey held a press conference <coughs> and announced the FBI would not recommend criminal charges. Yet Director Comey also personally criticized Secretary Clinton in the middle of her presidential campaign. The IG found that Director Comey's criticism, and I quote, was contrary to longstanding department practice and protocol, end quote, for, quote, essentially trashing the subject of an investigation with uncharged misconduct that Comey, every agent, and every prosecutor agreed did not warrant prosecution, end quote. Following his July 5th announcement, Mr. Comey testified before Congress numerous times and spoke at length about the Clinton investigation, ensuring that this would remain in the press during the final months of the presidential election. Then on October 28th, 2016, Mr. Comey informed Congress that he had reopened the investigation. However, after it finally performed its due diligence, the FBI determined there was nothing new or significant. The Inspector General also specifically criticized the October 28th notification to Congress as also violating, quote, longstanding department and FBI policies and norms, end quote. As explained in the report, and I quote, the department and the FBI consistently declined to comment publicly 
or to Congress regarding ongoing investigative activity. However, while the report is highly critical of Director Comey, it did not find that he was biased against President Trump or in favor of Secretary Clinton, as some have alleged. During the election, Director Comey, the FBI, and the Justice Department spoke publicly about the Clinton investigation, but remained silent on the investigation into the Trump campaign's ties to Russia. And while there were multiple leaks to the press about the Clinton investigation, there was not a single leak about the investigation of the Trump campaign. Both investigations were ongoing during the presidential election, but only the Clinton investigation was discussed publicly. This unquestionably harmed candidate Clinton and helped candidate Trump. The president is now citing the inspector general's report to justify his decision to fire Director Comey. However, at the time, candidate Trump applauded the October announcement, declaring at a rally in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I quote, Director Comey did the right thing, end quote. In addition, one day after he fired Director Comey, the president reportedly told Russian officials that firing Comey relieved the pressure from the Russia investigation. And two days after the firing, President Trump himself told Lester Holt he fired Director Comey for, quote, the Russia thing, end quote. This is under investigation by Special Counsel Mueller, and the IG's report provides no support for the claim that Mr. Comey was fired because of his handling of the Clinton investigation. The report also finds that some employees expressed personal political views through text messages on workplace devices. Many messages criticized Donald Trump, but there were also some that criticized Hillary Clinton and others. Importantly, the report found no evidence that these personal political views tainted workplace decisions. In fact, two of the employees who exchanged messages, Peter Strzok and Lisa Page, were also identified in the report as advocating some of the most aggressive action in the Clinton investigation. For example, Mr. Strzok wrote the initial draft of the October 28th letter announcing the reopening of the Clinton investigation. The IG and his office have spent a year and a half examining this. They have reviewed all of these text messages. They have interviewed these employees and they found no evidence that political views influenced the Clinton investigation. The overwhelming lesson to be taken from this report is the danger of public discussion in ongoing investigations. Throughout the Clinton investigation, Republicans in Congress demanded information from Director Comey and the Justice Department under subpoena and threat of contempt. Today, they are doing the same thing with Special Counsel Mueller's investigation. It was wrong then, and it's wrong now. The Inspector General report says, quote, the stay silent principle exists to protect the privacy and reputational interests of the subjects of the investigation, the right to a fair trial for those subsequently accused of crimes, the integrity of an ongoing investigation or pending litigation, and the department's ability to effectively administer justice without political or other undue outside influences." End quote. Instead of demanding disclosure of information about Special Mueller's ongoing investigation, Congress should protect the integrity and investigation of that work. Let me say in closing, 
While I disagree with his actions, I have seen no evidence that Mr. Comey acted in bad faith or that he lied about any of his actions. As we consider this report, let's not lose sight of the fact that the IG found no evidence that the FBI and Justice Department are politicizing investigations and nothing warrants the attacks that we are seeing on the FBI, the Justice Department, or Special Counsel Mueller's investigation. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. you, Senator Feinstein. I will give a short introduction of our two witnesses, and then I would administer an oath before they testify. Uh, Michael Horowitz, Inspector General for the Justice Department, was confirmed April 2012 and oversees a nationwide workforce of more than 400 employees. Immediately preceding this post, he was in private practice and also previously worked for the Justice <coughs> Department's criminal division. The Inspector General's mission is to detect and deter waste, fraud, abuse, and misconduct. Its mission is to also promote economy and efficiency in the department's operation. Christopher Ray is the director of the FBI, confirmed August last year. He is in charge of the Bureau's day-to-day -day operations, as well as overseeing the performance of field offices and special branches nationwide. From 2003 to 2005, Mr. Ray served as Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division at DOJ. Mr. Ray also served as Associate Deputy General and then Principal Associate Deputy Attorney General prior to his promotion in 2003. And uh, I know as well that he was in private practice for a while before he became FBI Director. If you would stand, I would like to administer an oath. Uh, do you affirm that the testimony you're about to give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you both for that affirmation. Uh, we'll start with uh, uh, General Horowitz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Feinstein, members of the committee. Uh, thank you for inviting me to testify today. Our 500 plus page report provides a thorough, comprehensive and objective recitation of the facts related to the departments and the FBI's handling of the Clinton email investigation. It was the product of 17 months of investigative work by a dedicated OIG team. They reviewed well over 1.2 million documents and interviewed more than 100 witnesses, many on multiple occasions. The review team followed the evidence wherever it led, and through their efforts, we identified the inappropriate text and instant messages discussed in the report. Additionally, the OIG's painstaking forensic examinations recovered thousands of text messages that otherwise would have been lost or undisclosed. As detailed in our report, we found that the inappropriate political messages we uncovered cast a cloud over the mid-year investigation, so doubt about the credibility of the FBI's handling of it, and impacted the reputation of the FBI. We found the implication that senior FBI employees would be willing to take official action to impact a presidential candidate's electoral prospects to be deeply troubling and antithetical to the core values of the FBI and the Justice Department. With regard to the decision to close the investigation without prosecution, we found no evidence <laughs> that the conclusions by the prosecutors were the result of improper considerations, including political bias, but rather were exercises of prosecutorial discretion by the prosecutors based on their assessment of the facts, the law, and past department practice. Our review also included a fact-based detailed assessment of certain specific investigative and prosecutorial decisions that were the subject of controversy. It was necessary to uh, select particular investigative decisions because it would not have been possible to recreate and analyze every decision made in a year-long investigation. In examining these decisions, the question we considered was not whether a particular decision was the most effective choice, but rather whether the documentary and testimonial evidence indicated the decision was based on improper considerations, including political bias. 
This approach is consistent with the OIG's handling of such questions in past reviews when assessing discretionary judgment calls and recognizes and respects the institutional oversight role of the OIG. Our report provides a comprehensive assessment of these decisions and of the mid-year investigation and details the factual evidence so that the public, Congress, and other stakeholders can conduct their own assessment of them. Within this framework, as to the specific investigative and prosecutive decisions we reviewed, we did not find documentary or testimonial evidence that improper considerations, including political bias, directly affected those specific decisions, in part because the decisions were made by the larger mid-year team or the prosecutors. This determination by the OIG, as I noted, does not mean that we necessarily endorse the decisions or conclude they were the most effective options among those considered or that, or that our finding should or can be extrapolated to cover other decisions made during the course of the investigation by the FBI employees who sent these inappropriate text messages. With, sorry, uh, conversely, we found the FBI's explanations for its failures to take immediate action after discovering the Wiener laptop in October 2016 to be unpersuasive. And we did not have confidence that the decision of Deputy Assistant Director Strzok to prioritize the Russia investigation over following up on the Wiener laptop was free from bias in light of his text messages. We also found that in key moments, then FBI Director Comey clearly departed from FBI and department norms, and his decisions negatively impacted the perception of the FBI and the Justice Department as fair administrators of justice. Director Comey concealed from the Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General his intention to make a unilateral announcement in July 2016 about the reasons for his recommendation not to prosecute former Secretary Clinton. His July 5th statement included inappropriate commentary about uncharged conduct, announced his views on what a quote unquote reasonable prosecutor would do, and served to confuse rather than clarify public understanding of his recommendation. In late October, he again acted without adequately consulting department leadership and contrary to important department norms when he sent a letter to Congress announcing renewed investigative activity days before the election. There are many lessons to be learned from the departments and the FBI's handling of the mid-year investigation. But among the most important is the need to respect the institution's hierarchies and structures and to follow established policies, procedures, and norms, even in the highest profile and most challenging investigations. No rule, policy, or practice is perfect, of course. But at the same time, neither is any individual's ability to make judgments under pressure or in what may seem like unique circumstances. When leaders and officials adhere to bedrock principles and values, the public has greater confidence in the fairness and rightness of their decisions. And those institutions' leaders better protect the interests of federal law enforcement and the dedicated professionals who serve us all. By contrast, the public's trust is negatively impacted when law enforcement officials make statements reflecting bias, when leaders abandon institutional norms and the organizational hierarchy in favor of their own ad hoc judgments, and when the leadership of the department and the FBI are unable to speak directly with one another for the good of the institutions. Our report makes nine recommendations, most of which can be tied together through a common theme, that the FBI and the Justice Department remain, remain true to their foundational principles and values in all their work. That concludes my prepared statement. I'd be pleased to answer the committee's questions. Duray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Feinstein, members of the committee. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity to discuss the FBI's response to the report by the Justice Department's Office of Inspector General about the DOJ and FBI's activities in the run-up to the 2016 election. I take this report very seriously and we accept its findings and its recommendations. We're already addressing these recommendations in a number of ways and are determined to emerge 
from this experience better and wiser. Our mission at the FBI is to protect the American people and uphold the Constitution. And to carry out that mission, we're entrusted with significant authority. So our actions are subject to close oversight by the Congress, by the courts, and by independent entities like the Inspector General. That oversight, in my view, makes the FBI stronger as an organization and makes the public more safe. And so I appreciate the Inspector General's work in conducting this important review. Although the report did not find any evidence of political bias or improper considerations ultimately impacting the investigation under review, the report did identify errors of judgment, violations of or disregard for policy, and decisions that, at least in the benefit of hindsight, were certainly not the best choices. So I'd like to briefly summarize uh, what we're doing to respond to those findings and recommendations. First, we are going to hold accountable any employee for potential misconduct. We have already referred conduct highlighted in the report to our Office of Professional Responsibility, OPR, which is the FBI's independent disciplinary office. We're going to adhere to the disciplinary process that that office has fairly, but without delay. And once that process, once all the steps in that process are complete, we will not hesitate to hold people accountable. Second, we're gonna make sure that every FBI employee understands the lessons of this report through in-depth focused training, starting first at the top with all of our senior executives from around the world, and then every FBI employee to make sure that we do not repeat the mistakes identified in this report. Third, we're gonna make sure that we have the policies, the procedures, and the training needed for everyone to understand and remember what is expected of all of us. That includes things like drilling home the importance of objectivity and avoiding even the appearance of potential bias or conflicts of interest in our work, ensuring that recusals are handled appropriately and correctly and are clearly communicated to the right people, making all employees fully aware of our new policy on contacts with the new me news media, which I issued last November, and making clear that we will not tolerate noncompliance with that policy. Ensuring that we follow all DOJ policies about public statements on ongoing investigations and uncharged conduct. And ensuring that our employees adhere strictly to the policies and procedures we have on the use of FBI systems, networks, and devices. I've also directed our associate deputy director, who's the number three official in the organization, to lead a very focused review of how the FBI handles particularly sensitive investigations, how they're structured, staffed, supervised, so that every sensitive investigation can be conducted to the FBI's highest standards. The OIG's report makes clear that we have significant work to do. And as I said, we're gonna learn from the report and be better as a result. At the same time, I wanna emphasize that this report is focused on a specific set of events back in 2016 and a small number of FBI employees connected with those events. Mistakes made by those employees do not define our 37,000 men and women and the great work they do every day. Nothing in this report impugns the integrity of our workforce as a whole or the FBI as an institution. I wanna be very clear with this committee about the FBI that I've been able to see up close every day in the 10 months since my confirmation hearing before you all. I've been meeting with employees from over 30 of our field offices, from legal offices overseas, from every headquarters division, and over and over and over again, I hear incredible stories, remarkable, inspiring stories about the work our men and women are doing to protect the American people and uphold the Constitution. This year alone, we've rescued over 1,300 children from child predators. We've arrested more than 4,600 violent gang members in just the past several months. In the past several months, we've disrupted terrorist attacks ranging from the pier in San Francisco to a crowded shopping mall in Miami. I could go on and on, but the point is that the FBI's men and women as a whole are doing all this work with the unfailing fidelity to our constitution and laws that it demands, the bravery that it deserves, 
and the integrity that the American people rightly expect. As I've been trying to say since my confirmation hearing at every opportunity, I am committed to doing this job by the book and I expect all our employees to do the same in every respect. I am a huge believer in the importance of process and I believe strongly that the FBI's brand over 110 years is based more on the way we've accomplished our successes than our successes themselves. That means following our rules, following our laws, following our guidelines. We've got to stay faithful to our core values and best traditions. And there will inevitably be times when we feel extraordinary pressure to not follow our process and policies, but those are precisely the times when it's most important to adhere to them. We're trying to make sure that we're not just doing the right thing, but that we're doing it in the right way and pursuing the facts independently and objectively, no matter who likes it. That, in my view, is the best way. That, in my view, is the only way to maintain the trust and credibility of the American people we serve. So, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Feinstein, members of the committee, thank you again for the opportunity to address the report. I look forward to answering the committee's questions. Uh, thank you. And I believe uh, staff has probably informed each member of the committee that we'll have eight minute rounds. And because of three votes on the floor of the United States Senate at 530, uh, we'll probably only end up having one round. Uh, first to Mr. Horowitz, the IT worker who managed the Clinton server lied to the FBI repeatedly. He denied deleting the Clinton emails. He denied that Clinton staff had ever asked him to delete the emails. He denied knowing the emails were under a preservation order. On March 2015, he had a call with Clinton's lawyers. Right after that, he used bleach bit to uh, delete the Clinton emails. He invoked the Fifth Amendment to avoid questions about that call. He even sent an email saying that he was part of, quote, Hillary cover-up operation, end of quote. He later claimed that that was only a joke. But there was no search warrant or subpoena for the laptops used by the Clinton lawyers to see what they knew about what he did. Uh, he did not get the Mueller treatment. No charges for lying to the FBI repeatedly. No pressure to flip and testify against Clinton lawyers. Quite the opposite, he got immunity. This is a good example of a double standard in these two investigations and why more and more people are starting to believe the Mueller investigation lacks fairness. The report noted that Director Comey pressured the team to close the case before the party convention, and he had already made up his mind to close it before all the work was done. Question number one, isn't it improper to set a deadline to close a case based upon political calendar? Um, Mr. Chairman, I think if that's the only basis for setting the deadline, that would be an area of concern. Um, and that was something we did ask about in connection with our report, um, given the various areas where Director Comey raised the concern about the political calendar. We had some information from some folks uh, indicating that he separately suggested that in addition to uh, concern about the political calendar, um, that they also should um, follow up as need be for their work. So that, that was the evidence we had before us. Is it a fair inference, General Horowitz, for people to think that the time pressure and the predetermined decision not to charge Clinton explained the lack of interest in trying to charge and flip the witness? Uh, it's certainly, as we've laid out here, one of the reasons given by the prosecutors with regard to certain of their decisions, that they felt it would have dragged on the investigation for too long and that that was in fact a factor in their consideration on how to resolve certain issues. A second point would involve you and the director of the FBI. The report notes that department prosecutors did not believe there was a substantial federal interest to charge the IT worker who deleted Clinton's emails with obstruction and false statements. However, it was clear that he lied to the FBI twice about deleting Clinton's archived emails. The emails had been subpoenaed and were uh, subject to congressional preservation notice. The technician knew that when he deleted them. Question number one to both of you. Is granting immunity the only way to obtain truthful testimony from a witness 
And isn't there a substantial federal interest in determining obstruction of congressional investigation? It isn't the only way to get uh, testimony from individuals or information from individuals. Obviously, it depends on the facts. And also, as we laid out in the report, we found the conduct to be particularly serious. Right here, right? Uh, likewise, I think there are a number of ways to secure truthful testimony from witnesses, not just one. Uh, and certainly my own view is that efforts to obstruct investigations are something we need to take extremely seriously at the federal level. Okay, thank you. Uh, to the uh, Mr. Horowitz, did the officials specifically tell you that obstructing Congress was not a matter of substantial federal interest? Uh, they didn't specifically say that to us. We asked them for their reasons and they explained various other reasons that we lay out in the report. Okay. Uh, former Director Comey said on television that the Inspector General interviewed him about the handling of his memos of conversations with President Trump. Some of those memos contained classified information. Comey said he did not expect a report on his handling of classified information because quote unquote, that's frivolous. I don't happen to think that it is frivolous. Question number one to Mr. Horowitz, are you investigating Comey's handling of his memos? And does that include the classification issues? And should Mr. Comey expect a report when it is complete? Um, we received a referral on that from the FBI. We are handling that referral and we will issue a report when um, the matter is complete, consistent with the law and rules that, that are, and uh, a report that's consistent and takes those into account. Okay. Uh, in, the F, in the FBI's report, response to the Inspector General's report, the FBI said, quote, there is no indication that any classified material ever transited former Director Comey, Ms. Pages, or Mr. Strzok's uh, personal devices or accounts. But I thought neither the Inspector General nor the FBI actually looked at their personal devices. I sent a letter to you, Director Ray, this morning on this topic, but I wanted to ask you, how can the FBI conclude no classified material was on their personal de de uh, devices if you didn't even look at their devices? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, first, as to your letter, I, I haven't uh, obviously seen your, your letter of today, but I'm happy to take a look at it and, and make sure we're being responsive to you on that. Uh, on the second part of your question and the, the words in our response to the Inspector General's report, uh, I don't think we're attempting to characterize some independent investigation of our own, but rather to refer to the language in the Inspector General's report uh, and to clarify that the findings that we're reacting to did not themselves identify any passage of classified information. Uh, during the course of the review, uh, you found that several of the people investigating Secretary Clinton were using personal email, were doing the same thing themselves. Each agency and every employee has an obligation to comply with the Federal Records Act Question number one to Mr. Horowitz, in light of the law's record, the law's record keeping requirements, how did you try to get access to their personal devices or accounts? Um, one of the challenges we had, as we note in the report, is that um, to gain access to personal emails would have required either a grand jury subpoena or a search warrant, given the facts of this case. Um, and so we were limited because our administrative subpoena authority doesn't cover this to ask uh, for voluntary cooperation. We were given oral representations. We were not given access to the email account. Yeah. Uh, so I don't go over my eight minutes. I think I'll reserve my 24 seconds. Senator Feinstein. Thanks very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, during the 2016 presidential election, in addition to investigating Hillary Clinton's use of a private email server, the FBI was actively investigating whether the Trump campaign was coordinating with Russian officials to influence the election. Although the FBI revealed the existence of the Clinton investigation to the public, it kept the existence of the Trump campaign investigation secret. Director Comey made several public statements about the Clinton investigation during the election. 
Was there any information about anyone making public statements about the Trump campaign investigation during the election? Um, I'm not aware of any, and we lay out here the discussion about whether or not to speak to that issue. There were also several leaks to the press about Clinton investigations during the election. Was there any evidence of leaks to the press about the Trump campaign investigation during the election? I, I don't know as I sit here. Is there any reason for this disparity in treatment between the two investigations? We our focus in this review was on the Clinton email review. We laid out quite clearly why we thought Director Comey should not have been making the public statements he made back when he made them. So I guess, I guess what you're saying is that the better approach um, is not to make public statements and that goes to everybody, but you didn't specifically right. criticize it or right. find criticism. That's correct. I mean, we looked at this one decision and what occurred. We laid out what the decision was with regard to other investigations, both Russia and, by the way, the Clinton Foundation investigation, where a decision was made also not to speak about it. On October 25th, Trump's surrogate Rudy Giuliani appeared on Fox News and bragged that the Trump campaign had, quote, a surprise or two you're going to hear about in the next few days. I'm talking about some pretty big surprises. And I do think that all of these revelations about Hillary Clinton finally are beginning to have an impact. Three days later, Director Comey announced that the FBI would be reopening its investigation into Hillary Clinton's use of a private email server. On November 4, when asked whether he had heard about the FBI's reopening of the email investigation, Giuliani said, did I hear about it? You're darn right I heard about it. He went on to say, I'd expected this for the last, honestly, to tell you the truth, I thought it was going to be three or four weeks ago. Were you able to determine how Mr. Giuliani received this information? Uh, Senator, I'm not going to speak to any of the investigative steps we may or may not have taken for the very reasons we describe in here about what's appropriate to do in terms of following policy. Well, what actions, if any, have been taken against the individuals responsible for disclosing this information to Mr. Giuliani? Um, as we note in the report, um, our investigative work is still ongoing. We put this in here so that uh, the readers and the public could see our concerns about the number of contacts with the media and what was going on systemically but I'm not in a position at this point to speak to any investigative outcomes. Do you believe disclosures of this sort, especially during an election, are appropriate? Are they lawful? I don't believe disclosures of this sort are appropriate at any point in time in a criminal investigation. I was a former prosecutor, worked extensively with FBI agents in my prior capacity, and all of us would have thought that was entirely inappropriate. The report says that you, and I quote, will separately report on those investigations as they are concluded. Does this mean that this leak investigation is ongoing? Our work remains ongoing, and when we can do that consistent with the IG Act, the law policy, we will do so. Republicans in Congress have pressured the Department of Justice to reveal details about special, special counsel Mueller's investigation into Russian interference in the 16 election and possible obstruction of justice. As a result, sensitive information about this ongoing investigation is now in the public domain. For example, a possible confidential informant has been identified. Is disclosure of the identity of a possible source in an ongoing investigation consistent with the state silent principle identified in the report. Um, Senator, I obviously can't speak to any specific factual circumstances beyond what's in our report. I haven't done work on it. I will say just generally, um, it goes to my prior answer as well, which is if there's an ongoing investigation, um, disclosing information related to that through leaks um, is inappropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Hatch. <laughs> 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Listen to these findings from the Inspector General's report on the uh, handling of the Clinton email investigation. Error of judgment, serious error of judgment, extremely poor judgment, and a gross lack of professionalism. Now, these are conclusions that were drawn respectively about the conduct of former Attorney General of the United States, the former Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and FBI special agents assigned to one of the highest profile investigations in the Bureau's history. <clears throat> in my opinion, this is appalling. And the significance of these findings cannot be overstated. The report identifies missteps at every level of the Department of Justice from our nation's chief federal law enforcement officer to special agents in the field. Director Ray, I have to say that I was disappointed by your response last week to the Inspector General report. And while you admitted that the report found errors of judgment, you took pains to emphasize that the report focused on, quote, a small number of FBI employees, unquote. Well, let's remember who that small number of employees was the director of the FBI, the deputy director of the FBI, the leader of both the Clinton email investigation and the Russia investigation. These were not junior field agents. These were senior agency officials. They were running two of the most important investigations in the Bureau's history. And they were insubordinate, grossly unprofessional in their communications, and even untruthful. So let's not pretend like this was some one-off problem. There is a serious problem with the culture at FBI headquarters. Your statement last week seemed to suggest we shouldn't worry too much about the events detailed in the Inspector General report because the report focuses on a small group of individuals and events. Well, I think that's exactly backwards. If we can look at, at only one or two investi investigations and find this much bias and unprofessionalism, I can only imagine what else is out there and what the Inspector General found about the conduct of senior bureau leadership. Uh, I'd have to say he, he found out that it would certainly, in my opinion, be damning. Now, how can you assure Congress and the American people that you're taking seriously the problems identified in the Inspector General report when your very first public response to the report was to downplay its significance. Senator, I don't intend in any way to downplay the significance of the report. I don't know uh, if you do, but, but I'd like to know why. Right. And uh, I think the fact that uh, the very first press conference I've held in my 10 months as FBI director was on this is a measure of how important I think this is. Start with that. Second, the steps that I've outlined that we're going to be taking are very significant, including just as an example, but I could go on and on, convening every single SES employee in the entire FBI to come for a full day of training specifically focused on this as a measure of how seriously I take this. We're going to have the people who are whose conduct is highlighted in the report handled through our disciplinary process and held accountable as is appropriate. But my comments the other day are a measure of my view of the FBI. I don't have to imagine what happens in the FBI. I see the FBI up close every day, investigation after investigation after investigation, including in Utah, including in the states of every state represented up on this dice. And I can tell you that the conduct, the character, the principle that I see in those people every day is extraordinary and would be an inspiration to the members of this committee and that was my point okay there should be no doubt that these errors cast a cloud over the fbi's handling of the clinton email investigation and the investigation's credibility now even more troubling is the irreparable harm to the fbi's reputation for neutral fact finding and political independence where do we go from here well, you kind of indicated that. I, I think we start by reminding everyone in the FBI, which, as I said, I think the vast, vast, vast majority of the people who work there already know this, but I'm not going to leave that to doubt. Okay. Uh, that objectivity and the appearance of objectivity have to permeate everything we do. 
And that starts with much as the lessons that have been described in this report chronicle, that starts with being focused not just on the result, but on the way you get to the result. That means following our processes, following our guidelines, following our long established norms, to use the yeah, phrase in the report. I, accept, yeah. uh, I want to thank Inspector General Horowitz and you, the FBI Director Ray, for being here today to help answer that question. I want to focus on two issues identified in the report. The first is improper disclosures to the media. And the second is the political bias evidenced in text messages between FBI employees. The FBI has a policy that strictly limits the employees who are authorized to speak to the media. This is appropriate for any organization that quietly investigates with an eye towards prosecution in a court of law uh, rather than the court of public opinion. But the inspector general found that uh, this policy was widely ignored by employees at all levels of the FBI. The report goes so far as to describe a culture of unauthorized media contacts including instances where FBI employees improperly receive tickets, golf outings, drinks, and other benefits from, from reporters. Now, as you know, this is totally inappropriate. Uh, the Director Ray attachments to the report identify more than 50 FBI employees, 50, who apparently had unauthorized contact with members of the media. If the Inspector General identified 50 employees in connection with his review, of this one investigation, a counterintelligence investigation no less, I'm afraid that the number of employees engaged in such unauthorized conduct across the uh, Bureau is likely to be far greater. Now clearly additional action is needed to identify other personnel engaged in leaks and unauthorized media contacts. I'm not interested in hearing about additional training, which is, un which is certainly necessary, but not sufficient. Director Ray, what are you doing to identify those who violate the FBI's policy and what consequences will those employees face? So uh, a couple things we're doing that I'll mention. First, we, uh, in addition to creating a new policy to make it painfully and crystally clear so no one can have an excuse that they don't know what the rules are, I changed, I put in place a new policy in November. Second, we've created a dedicated leak investigation unit inside the bureau specifically focused to ensure that those investigations have priority third we have an insider threat center that we've elevated to the assistant director level uh, that's focused on pulling together all the because these kinds of issues raise insider threat type concerns from my view uh, i've also asked the head of our opr to report back to me promptly about whether or not there are additional things that she would need to make sure the penalties are even more severe. Uh, and we won't hesitate to throw the book at people who violate our rules on this. Okay, thank you. I think my time is up. Senator Lee. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is an interesting um, hearing in practice. Irony doesn't begin to describe President Trump and his allies exploiting this report for partisan gain. Clearly, some of Mr. Strzok's text messages were inappropriate. But if the FBI were trying to throw the election to Hillary Clinton, they could not have done a worse job. They're the front pages of every newspaper leading up to the election. Every single misstep by the FBI damaged Hillary Clinton, helped Donald Trump. All FBI personnel, including Mr. Strzok, kept quiet about the Russian investigation as they should. The same can be said about the Clinton investigation. Rudy Giuliani, James Kalsper, apparently even Devin Nunes, received highly sensitive leaks. Leaks from the New York field office may have even contributed to Director Comey's decision to send the now infamous October 28th letter. A letter that could not have come at a worse time likely impacted the election. Now, last year, I asked in Director Comey specifically about leaks to Mr. Giuliani. He acknowledged for the first time that internal investigation was ongoing. Uh, Director Ray, was uh, Mr. Comey telling the truth in that? He, he said here that uh, uh, there was an internal investigation ongoing about the leaks to uh, Mr. Giuliani. Was he correct? Uh, uh, Senator, I can't speak to what Director Comey was or wasn't. I'm just saying. asking, but, but was he correct that there is an internal investigation ongoing 
on the links to Mr. Giuliani. Um, Senator, I, for reasons that I'm sure you can appreciate, I can't confirm or deny the existence of an ongoing investigation, uh, whether there is one or isn't one. Okay. One of the main lessons of this the report. The reason I raise it is that with an open hearing, uh, former Director Comey said there was such an internal investigation. Well, the, there are a number of things that I probably would have done differently. So, Horace, you want, you want to take a stab at that? Or I'm so? certainly not going to comment on uh, whether or not there is an open or ongoing investigation one way or the other. We have, over the years, refused to do that. and I'm not going to change the policy now. Well, Mr. Horace, you and I have known each other a long time. I assume that's the answer you get. But we, but here we know about Mr. Shrug's private life. And we know about his text messages. But we know nothing about the leaks from FBI personnel who are actively taking steps to sway the election to, to uh, Mr. Trump. You did not include an investigation of those leaks in your report. Is that correct? Reasons we noted able to speak to work with. I would, I would hope that the investigation is ongoing at some point you report to us because it was it was generally accepted around here that leaks were going to Mr. Castro and were going to Mr. Giuliani during the campaign. In fact, Mr. Giuliani basically said so on TV. Now, uh, the president says that this report totally exonerates him and says there's no collusion with the Russians. Now, Inspector General Horace, did your report even consider the question of collusion? Our report was focused on the FBI and department's handling of the Clinton email investigation. It touched on the Russia investigation as we lay out here when we found the text messages in that July-August time period, and then the decision that was made in October about whether to proceed or not proceed with the Wiener, Wiener laptop. That was the sum total of our... But there's effort. nothing in the report that says it exonerates the uh, president from uh, he, any question of collusion with the Russians. It says nothing one way or the other. Is that correct? We, we did not look into collusion okay. questions. So I, um, I just know the, the president says it totally exonerates him, even though there's no, no conclusion one way or the other. Uh, about the uh, uh, question of collusion with the Russians. Now, uh, Director Ray, after learning that the FBI utilized a confidential source during the early stage of the Russian, uh, Russian investigation, the president described that as a scandal bigger than Watergate. Uh, I'm one of the few people here that the only person in, in, in the Senate that remembers directly uh, knowledge of Watergate, I tend to disagree with him. And I'd say the confidential sources are a routine investigative tool. I've got a, um, uh, I have a document that is publicly available in the FBI's online FOIA library. It's a redacted interview summary from the Clinton investigation. It so shows that the FBI used a confidential human source in September 2015, well into Secretary Clinton's campaign for president. So, Director, does the possible use of confidential sources in either the Clinton or Russia investigation by itself show any wrongdoing by the FBI? Uh, Senator, as you alluded to, we use confidential informants in all manner of investigations covering kind of the waterfront, and it's a very, very, very important tool in that mission. Any of us who have been prosecutors know you probably don't have a significant prosecution without some confidential sources. Now, Director Ray, the President said on Friday the Mueller investigation has been totally discredited by the Inspector General report. I asked you last month when you were before the Appropriations Committee about the Russia investigation. You confirmed that time you, you do not believe it is a witch hunt. Now, the special counsel investigation has already resulted in the indictment of 20 individuals, three Russian companies. Do you have any reason to believe that this investigation has been discredited? Senator, as I said to you last month, and as I said before, I do not believe Special Counsel Mueller is on a witch hunt. 
Thank you, and I appreciate that. And, and you were very direct in both uh, occasions. Now, the mistakes made by Director Comey during the Hillary Clinton investigation didn't exist in a vacuum. Republicans in Congress relentlessly pressured the FBI to release the details concerning the Clinton investigation. I, I'm deeply concerned that we're repeating these mistakes today. The White House, working with allies in Congress, have been aggressively demanding information from the Russia investigation. And Director Ray and uh, the Deputy Attorney General pushed back. They've been threatened with impeachment. That's outrageous. Obviously, something will not, never happen. But some accommodations have been made. And members of Congress eager to politicize any details have reviewed a FISA application and learned the identity of a confidential source. Are you confident that, that kind of precedent will not damage the FBI in the future? Senator, I think we have two competing interests that we have to balance. We have an obligation to be responsive to congressional oversight. That's important. I think that's part of our job. But we also have an obligation to protect sources and methods, to protect ongoing criminal investigations, to respect things like grand jury secrecy. Uh, and it's a challenge at times to do both. But I'm confident that we can do both as long as both sides are willing to work together on it. And I'm committed to trying to do both. Senator Thank Corner. you very much. Senator Corner. General Horowitz, um, I believe your report summarizes as regards to former Director Comey that he concealed from the Attorney General his intention to make a unilateral declaration or declination uh, of intent to pursue charges against uh, Secretary Clinton. He made inappropriate comments on uncharged conduct. He uh, erred when he said that no reason, he usurped really the role of the Attorney General in the Department of Justice when he said that no reasonable prosecutor would bring charges under the facts um, and that he did, violated a number of Department of Justice uh, policies and norms. Is that correct? That's correct. I think your opinion was uh, certainly reinforced by op-ed pieces by former Attorney General Holder uh, when he wrote an op-ed uh, in the Washington Post and by uh, uh, Jamie Gorelick and Larry Thompson, former Deputy Assistant Attorney Generals, in an article they wrote, James Comey is damaging our democracy. The um, Rosenstein memo that was uh, written by the Deputy Attorney General forwarded to the Attorney General and then uh, attached, I think, to a letter uh, whereby the President informed Mr. Comey that he is, his services is uh, de director of the FBI were being terminated uh, substantially um, or substantially similar to what you found in your report, correct? Um, I haven't gone back recently and read the letter. I think it's uh, a straightforward comparison that could be made about it. Um, I'll leave it at that. Well, the way I read it, it looks to me like uh, you validated what um, Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein said in his memorandum. Would you dispute that or do you agree with that? I wouldn't dispute it, but I haven't gone back recently and reread it. I think what's so disturbing about this era in the FBI leadership is it just seemed to be a culture of impunity um, where the rules did not apply to the director and his leadership team, but uh, obviously were designed to apply to everybody else. And by the way, I agree with Director Ray when he talks about rank and file FBI. Uh, professionals. Uh, we're not talking about them. We're talking about a group that somehow uh, went terribly awry in the leadership team of uh, Director Comey. Um, General Horowitz, you mentioned uh, that you found no evidence of bias in, um, in the investigation, but you qualify that in talking about documentary and testimonial evidence. Are you, uh, are you discounting the uh, text messages from, um, from um, Mr. Strzok and Ms. Ms. Page, for example? Now, what we were trying to do was be clear that we were focused on ver the very specific investigative decisions we looked at. And what was significant about the pre, and I'm now talking about the pre-July 5 announcement decisions, was that uh, 
Stroke Page and others were not the sole decision makers there. They were team decisions, and in many cases, prosecutors' decisions as opposed to the individuals who wrote the emails. We made very clear we were not saying that as to every single decision, as you know from doing these kind of cases. There are hundreds of decisions being made, and in fact, uh, we found, we did not find no bias with regard to the October events. Well, Director Comey was pretty clear that he uh, expected Hillary Clinton to be the next president of the United States, correct? Um, he described that with regard to, yes, the October events, uh, the Wiener laptop. And sometime in the spring of 2016, he already decided that there would be no recommendation to prosecute Hillary Clinton, correct? Yes, he started drafting his statement on May 2nd. And uh, it wasn't until July 5th when he made his initial press conference where he's where he said that uh, the evidence did not rise to uh, the point where any reasonable prosecutor basically would prosecute Ms. Clinton, correct? That's correct. Do you think it's possible, or let me just ask you, is it a fair inference to draw that Director Comey expecting Ms. Clinton to win the presidency was thinking about his future as the FBI director? I think that was a concern we had certainly where it's even clearer in that October time period, because we have testimony that indicated when he explained why, when he explained through his chief of staff why he was going to do what he did on October 28th, he was concerned about his survivability. And when, for example, he used the word grossly negligent, which are the words of the statute, mm -hmm. in describing Ms. Clinton's conduct, later on it was uh, changed to extremely careless. Uh, do you feel like he was writing toward a preordained result? or that this was a genuine process to think through um, what the evidence was and to try, try to apply the applicable law? I think that would be hard to say and probably be speculation in terms of what he was thinking at the time. We try and lay out in great detail various places, including that, how it changed and how it evolved and why. But I'm not sure I can sit here and say precisely what was his thinking on the time. Were you shocked to learn that Director Comey had his own private Gmail account? At a time he was investigating a potential prosecution of uh, Ms. Clinton for uh, recklessly using a private email server. I have to say it surprised us that he would have been sending emails, although they were unclassified, but nevertheless um, using a personal Gmail account. <laughs> Director Ray, it's um, Director Comey has talked about higher loyalty to his own sense of justice and his, uh, his uh, belief that that was required uh, in order to protect the reputation of the FBI rather than to follow established policies and guidelines and the law. I believe that that, that, um, that hubris that uh, Director Comey was demonstrating and suggesting that the rules did not apply to him that applied to everybody else has brought this firestorm down on the FBI. Do you think it's appropriate for any director of the FBI to uh, to attribute their actions to a higher loyalty to some other cause other than the rule of law and the policies and guidelines of the Department of Justice? Well, Senator, I don't want to speak to what Director Comey may or may not have been thinking, but what I can tell you is that my own view is that the rules, the policies, the guidelines, the long established norms as the Inspector General's report refers to them, those things are there for a reason. And it's important that we track those. And that's why when I'm going around from field office to field office doing town halls with over 30 offices, the point I keep making everywhere is that it's not enough to say that you're gonna do the right thing for the right reason. That pretty quickly can become the ends justify the means. What we need to be doing is doing the right thing in the right way. So not let the ends justify the means, but let our means justify our ends. Well, General Horowitz, I believe that your report is comprehensive as it was, and I commend you on the great care uh, that you've undertaken. I don't necessarily agree with every word of it, including especially the uh, no finding of no bias, but I think your findings call into question the credibility of the whole Clinton email investigation and cast a cloud over the Russian, invest, Russian investigation because the same group of people that led the Clinton email investigation uh, we're leading the Russian investigation until at least such time as um, Director Mueller 
the special counsel terminated their services because of the appearance of conflict of interest. Do you share those concerns? I, I share the concerns, and we wrote, in fact, here that it did cast a cloud over the entire Clinton email investigation. And the Russian investigation? Well, we haven't reached a conclusion on that, but we laid out here the concern that when the this choice was made in October, whether to work on the, in terms of Mr. Strzok in particular, the Russian investigation versus the Wiener laptop matter, the choice was to make that a higher priority, the Russian matter, over the Clinton matter, and we were not convinced that that was not a biased decision. Senator Durbin. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for your testimony. The communication which you go into detail uh, describing between Peter Strzok and Lisa Page includes some damning statements. Uh, and you make that very clear in your conclusion uh, about they're possibly using their governmental authority to achieve a political result. Is that correct? That's correct. I felt that was very serious error. And that should not be downplayed by anyone. It was serious. That should not be wrong. downplayed by anybody. I can't think of something more concerning than a law enforcement officer suggesting that they're going to try and use or may use their powers to affect an election. What did Special Counsel Mueller do when he learned about these statements by Mr. Strzok? Um, we informed him on July 27 of, of last year of our first findings of these texts. We subsequently gained more, but my understanding is within a week or two of that day, he had been removed from the investigation. Which was the right thing to do. And I want to make it clear based on previous questioning here, no one is making excuses for these things. Mr. Strzok said something that was inappropriate, unacceptable for a person in his position. Mr. Mueller responded professionally and terminated him as soon as he learned that. I hope that's on the record and clear. You spent a lot of time, and I just I want to echo the comments um, made earlier in this work, um, reviewing all these documents, text, and interviewing all these witnesses. And I, I know you, and I'm, I've heard your testimony, and there's no doubt that you, you know this Inspector General's report in detail. Lots of people reacted to it politicians, individuals, news commentators, and others. I'm going to ask you for the record, specifically your thoughts on one reaction. Last Friday, President Trump said, and I quote, I think that the report yesterday, maybe more importantly than anything, it totally exonerates me. There was no collusion. There was no obstruction. And if you read the report, you'll see that, the president said. He went on to say, I did nothing wrong. There was no collusion. There was no obstruction. The IG report yesterday went a long way to show that. End of quote. General Horowitz, does your report totally exonerate President Trump? I'm going to stick, Senator, to what our report does speak to, which is the handling of the Clinton email investigation. And to the extent it touches on the Russia investigation, it does it as we lay out here. When the Wiener laptop comes up in October, and I can't speak beyond that to what, how this report might impact the Russian investigation or what individuals think it, how it may impact the Russian, the Russian investigation. I ask you to clarify that. You can't speak to whether your report exonerates because it does or it doesn't? What are you we, saying? We did not investigate. As we laid out here, when we saw those text messages, many of which are in that July-August time period, we made it quite clear here that this review does not touch on the Russia investigation with the exception of what occurred in October with the Wiener laptop. And does it say anything as to the issues of collusion and obstruction in that Russian investigation? Um, we don't go into any issues related to the to the Russian investigation beyond what I mentioned. Last Friday, when he was talking about the IG report, President Donald Trump said the special counsel investigation led by Robert Mueller, quote, has been totally discredited. Mr. Harwich, does your report show any reason to doubt Robert Mueller's integrity or discredit any decisions he has made? Uh, I'm not going to make, Senator, a judgment on uh, Special Counsel Mueller's investigation. I can only, I'm going to speak to what I have here. I want to stay within the four and corners I, of your report. And I'm you not, address the credibility of the investigation of Robert Mueller. We did not address the credibility of the Special Counsel's investigation here. We laid out what occurred and um, we laid out 
what individuals did in October, where it touches the Russia investigation. Last Thursday, Senate Majority Leader uh, Mitch McConnell said in an interview with the Washington Examiner, he wanted the Mueller investigation to conclude. He said, quote, if the IG is through, why can't the Mueller investigation finally wrap up? Was there any connection in substance or duration between what you were tasked in doing and what Robert Mueller is tasked in doing? Again, other than the issues we talked about where we identified text messages and brought them to his attention, um, we do not have any connections, interactions in that regard. Director Ray, uh, my colleagues, Senator Leahy and others have raised the question about the New York field office and leaks in that field office. And there are quotes uh, in the report relative to Mr. Comey's concern that New York field office would leak information. And that's one of the reasons why he made certain decisions. As Senator Leahy said, uh, former Mayor Giuliani has bragged publicly about information that he's received from that office. What are we to make of this? Is this being investigated? Is this just a problem that is acknowledged and accepted? Uh, Senator, I think leaks are unacceptable. I think they have a pernicious effect on our ability to conduct investigations, to protect sources and methods, to retain our foreign liaison partner relationships. They damage the privacy of individuals under investigation. I could go on and on. So. I have a very strong view about it, and we're doing a number of things to try to make sure we That's crack what I down want to get to. Right. What, what are we doing about it? Well, I can't, I can't comment on any specific investigation, but we have, as I think I mentioned uh, uh, earlier, we have a dedicated unit specifically focused on leak investigations. That's new. We have a policy that we issued in November that makes the rules crystal clear so that there can't be any ambiguity for any of our employees in any office about what their obligation are and and when there are uh, misconduct found we will refer them to our OPR for appropriate action and if we find one that's criminal we will pursue it criminally. Mr. Uh, uh, Dr. Ray I just have a minute and a half left and I'd like to ask <laughs> one last question please. Uh, there was a question raised earlier about Mr. Comey having a separate personal phone uh, that he was using and whether or not that was an unusual thing for a person in his position. Uh, there's been reportedly the president uses two White House issued iPhones. One allows him to make calls. The second is for his Twitters, his Twitter habit. According to Politico, the president has, quote, resisted his aides and treaties to swap out the Twitter phone on a monthly basis because it's too inconvenient. Supported, supposedly, the president's given Kim Jong un his direct phone number. If he was referring to his cell phone, this would raise some interesting security concerns. Are you aware of these reports about various phones that are being used by the president? Are you concerned about whether or not sensitive information from those devices may be uh, intercepted by our adversaries? Senator, I'm not aware of the particulars of the president's phone usage. Would it be a matter of concern if anyone who has access to such information was using a device that could be intercepted by our enemies? I think it's important for all of us to recognize that device security is a particularly important part of our security. Uh, and it's something that we emphasize heavily in, in the intelligence community. And of course, we've gone to great lengths when it comes to Hillary Clinton to make that point. Thank you very much. Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks uh, to both of you for being here. I want to point out one clarifying matter at the outset. The report did in fact find bias. So I, insofar as anyone is suggesting that there was no bias found here, that's just not true. There was in fact bias found. What was not found was any smoking gun indicating that that bias translated to and, and was admitted to have translated to how anybody did their job. But the absence of evidence on that point is not the same as evidence of absence. And so I, I think we need to keep that in mind as we have this discussion. Um, Mr. Ray, I'd like to start with you on, on this point. Let's assume for a minute that these text messages um, between Strzok and, and Page, let's assume that these came about earlier in the discussion and that you just swap out uh, the name Trump 
uh, for Hillary. And as such, that the, the text messages said, well, she's not ever going to become president, is she? No, no, we'll stop it. What if that had been the exchange occurring earlier in the Midway investigation? In that circumstance, in that hypothetical, could she, as a practical matter, have been prosecuted, assuming that the facts warranted it, assuming that people uh, uh, making the charging decision concluded that there was good cause to charge her? Or, or would the bias displayed in that exchange make it too difficult to proceed? Well, Senator, I'm, I'm reluctant to engage in discussions of hypotheticals. It's I what do. we do. We're lawyers. We, right. we talk right. about hypotheticals, right? But I, I'm, I'm no longer practicing as a lawyer. Now, now, I get to, <laughs> now I get to blame the lawyers. It's a wonderful experience. Um, uh, I, so I'm not going to try to engage in specific hypotheticals. What I would tell you is that I expect all of our employees, all of our employees, to engage in professional conduct including in how they communicate with each other by text message. I, I get that. And that didn't happen here. So if, if uh, let's make it more of a hypothetical, then. let's take it a step back. Could that be a complicating factor? If you had text messages between agents involved in a case indicating bias against the target of that investigation, can that be a complicating factor in deciding whether to bring charges? I think any time that agents conduct themselves in a way that doesn't have not just objectivity, but the appearance of objectivity, that can have an impact on the viability of the case. Thank you. Mr. Horowitz, let's talk about these text messages for a minute. Was it easy for you to get them? No, it was, uh, well, the initial batch was easy. They were with the FBI and we requested them. The latter part of this over the last six months or so was challenging. Uh, uh, challenging. When you say challenging, tell me what you mean by that. So when they were produced by the FBI, it turned out that there was a period uh, during which about four to six months, I don't remember the exact time, where there were no text messages produced to us. Um, it turned out there was a flaw in their collection software or a failure in their collection software. We then went out and seized and obtained their two phones, voluntarily, I shouldn't say seized, obtained their phones from the FBI. These are now FBI devices we're talking about. And our cyber forensic team actually undertook a series of steps to, ex to seek to exploit, to extract the missing text messages from the phones. We first used our own tools to do that. That was step one. We then went to a contractor that we use, a vendor that we use, to see whether there were additional tools. Um, they provided us with some additional tools, so we did a second extraction and gained more text messages. We then went to the Department of Defense and asked them if they had additional tools that those first two steps didn't use. They said they did, and they gave us those tools, and we used that and extracted more uh, text messages. We then went to the FBI and said, okay, here are the steps we've taken. Do we miss anything? Would you do anything differently? They said they wouldn't. We then did a quality control check, as you're supposed to do, again, following the rules, our forensic examiners. And they discovered in that last search, which occurred last month in May, that the phone had a database on it that was actually also doing a collection of text messages. They extracted those messages from the phone and found the second part of the August 8th text. No, no, we'll stop it. That was found in early May because of that fourth effort to extract information from the phones. It turned out that the FBI wasn't aware that that database on there, which was supposed to be an operating function, was actually collecting data. They weren't aware of that and didn't give it to you, but had they gone through the same steps you had gone through, they might have found it. In Correct. Does that cause you to have any lack of confidence about whether or not you have all the evidence you need, all the evidence you've requested. It clearly, as a result of that effort, and we're going to issue a separate report about the uh, technological efforts we undertook there, and I'll be careful um, on how I describe them because I'm also a lawyer, not a cyber expert. But uh, the concern is we now believe that not only are we unsure whether we have 100% collection in the period for which there was this blackout, four to six months. But it's now clear to us that the, even when the software at the FBI was collecting text messages, because the August 8th period was within the collection period, we had the incoming 
page to struct text. We didn't have the response. It's now clear to us that even outside this blackout period, we're not convinced that the FBI was collecting, for obvious reasons, 100% of the text messages. Okay, that, that's obviously of concern. Uh, Mr. Ray, let's jump back to you for a minute. I think we can all agree that Mr. Comey should not have made his July 6th announcement and press conference. I assume you don't disagree with me on that. But would you have made a charging recommendation at all? Or would you have left that to the Department of Justice? Well, uh, Senator, as I said, we accept the findings and recommendations in the report. Uh, uh, my own view is that the policies uh, about public disclosure, as you've alluded to, are pretty clear about what we should or shouldn't do. As far as making charging recommendations privately, um, I think my view... Yeah, I'm not talking about recommendations. Right. I'm talking about charging decisions. Charges. So yeah. my view is that the FBI doesn't make charging decisions. Okay. It, it just isn't done. Um, Mr. Horowitz, uh, the report says that Mr. Comey's machinations, quote, resulted in Lynch and Yates concluding that it would be counterproductive to speak directly with the FBI director. Can you unpack that for me? Help me understand yeah. what that means. Is the is it is the idea here that, that that Lynch and Yates were simply afraid of exercising their authority, uh, their oversight responsibilities, because they were afraid that it would look like political interference? What's that about? So a couple things, um, they were responding to the fact that Director Comey, rather than speaking to them directly, went through his chief of staff to one of their aides to them to relay his view on what he was going to do. What they told us their assessment at that point was, based on their prior uh, dealings with Director Comey, was first of all, if they went to him directly and said, don't do it, um, it would, first of all, look like strong arming, and they weren't sure whether he would comply or not with the instruction. They concluded that it, they would have, it would be more effective or they would have a better chance of changing the decision if they went back the same way to him with their message, which was to their principal associate deputy AG, to his chief of staff, to him. And as we lay out here, they reported back through that means that they objected or recommended, or, or actually clarify this, they told him that they did not believe he should do it. He's testified to us that he took that as a recommendation because they didn't call him directly. And he decided they were leaving the decision to him. And so he decided to go forward. Before I call on Senator Klobuchar, I need a quick clarification. You said earlier in reply to Senator Corden that that Comey used Gmail for work, but only for unclassified information. How can you know that if you didn't get access to that account? I'm sorry, let me correct that. Um, based on the emails that we saw, which we observed by looking at the FBI's server and what ended up going back to the FBI. You're correct, Senator. I can't sit here today beyond what we looked at and say, precisely what other purposes he may have used it for. Okay. Senator Klobuchar. Thank you very much. Um, I wasn't going to start with this, but since Senator Lee was finishing up, I think it's good to continue with that discussion. Um, and that is that I uh, was a law school classmate of Director Comey. I think Director Ray knows this. Um, um, I have worked with him over the years and know he's done some good work. Uh, but reading this report this weekend, um, I continue to disagree with his decision in how he handled those announcements. And the more I read of your report, which I thought was very thorough, I wanna thank you for that, Mr. Horowitz, um, the more I began to focus on what you call the ad hoc decision-making based on his personal views, even if it meant rejecting long-standing department policy. And I guess I would start uh, with you, uh, Mr. Ray, the way I have described my job as a prosecutor in the past to people, when I do my own town hall meetings way back, I would always say, it's like the show, Law and Order. The first half of the show, the police do the investigation. The second half of the show, the prosecutors make a decision. Would you agree with that summary? I, I think so. I, I guess the way I would put it is we do an investigation. We determine whether or not we think there are sufficient facts uh, 
to go forward with a case. And then we present the facts to the prosecutors who then make the decisions and exercise prosecutorial discretion. I don't think prosecutorial discretion by definition is something the investigative agency exercises. Right. So you might discuss the case with the prosecutors, but in the end, they make the decision. Yes. And so if you had been in that place at that moment in time as the FBI director, would you have then called up in the July decision and the October decision, would you have then called up either the attorney general or the deputy attorney general to ask them to make a decision? Well, I don't know that I can speculate about what I would have done at the time. What I can tell you is that I cannot imagine a situation in which I would unilaterally assume for myself as the FBI director, a charging decision, and then announce it in a news conference. Thank you. Um, so that leads me to what, where I wanted to begin. And that is that when law enforcement officers act improperly, when they make mistakes, one of the great things about a democracy is we have an inspector general and we try to get that information out. And I think our democracy depends on that. But I don't think that should be confused with attacking the integrity of thousands of investigations that the FBI manages every year, investigations that are not even part of this report in any significant way, like the Russia investigation, and attacking the integrity of 35,000 FBI agents, analysts, and other public servants. I think it's very important that we defend them. And I note in your um, memo you did recently uh, to the FBI after the Nunez memo was released over the objections of the FBI. You said, Director Ray, talk is cheap. The work you do is what will endure. Um, and you urged employees to stay laser focused, even when it's not easy. Could you elaborate on that? Senator, I am a big believer in the idea that what really matters for the FBI is the work. And when I go around from office after office, the opinions that I care about the most, the brand, if you will, that I care about the most are the opinions of the prosecutors we work with out in the field, the law enforcement partners we work out with in the field, the judges that we interact with out in the field, the juries we interact with out in the field, the victims who are making decisions about who they trust to get their loved ones back. Uh, and I think I've visited the field offices of almost every senator up here. And I will tell you that the work that they do, recovering kids who are victims of child exploitation, taking down gang members, disrupting terrorist plots, doing public corruption investigations, I could go on and on and on and on and on. And to me, those are people who experience the FBI through the work. Those are people who get to see the professionalism, the character, the integrity of FBI people up close. Uh, we're a 37,000 person organization. We've been around for 110 years. We do thousands of investigations every year. This is one. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Horowitz, I want to go on to your report now. And either much has been made by my colleagues on the other side of the aisle about some things that were clearly wrong that Director Ray has said is going to, there are ongoing internal investigations about this and decisions are going to be made and training is going to occur. Um, but I don't want to lose the forest for the trees here in terms of what your report found. Um, first of all, the president, um, upon the release of the report, tweeted that he, quote, hope the IG report is not being changed and made weaker, end quote. Uh, can you confirm that your office followed all appropriate processes in the course of its review and that the report was not changed as a result of improper political influence? We followed normal processes. We took comments. We made decisions on the issuing the final report. It was not made weaker or softer in any regard. Okay. In particular, the report clearly states on page 263 that it did not find evidence of the Justice Department's decision not to pursue prosecution following the investigation was politically motivated. Is that an accurate summary? We did not find that the prosecutor's decision not to charge was the result of political bias. And you found that the relevant decisions were based on the prosecutor's assessment of the facts in the law, as well as in part department practices. Is that correct? As to the prosecutor's decision about whether or not to charge, that's correct. Mm -hmm. To be clear, did you or your staff speak to any witness who would point to an example of anyone in the investigation allowing political 
considerations to affect their decisions on how to obtain evidence? Um, as I sit here, I don't recall anybody um, indicating that. Do you or your staff review any documents indicating that a particular investigative decision, a decision was made for political reasons? Um, well, we had concerns about the October time period and Mr. Strzok's decision. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you, and you're talking here uh, in part about the, well, you mentioned the Russia one, but the Comey decisions to go public, is that what you're referring to? I'm sorry. I'm talking about in terms of, and maybe I misunderstood the question, in terms of were there any decisions, we had concerns about Mr. Strzok's handling of the choice in October between Russia and the Wiener laptop. Got it. Did you determine that, and Senator Durbin has gotten the information out there about Inspector Mueller's investigation and that's continuing and that he is no longer, the person involved is no longer involved in that investigation. That's that correct. correct. That's my understanding. That's correct. Did you determine that any investigative action was a result of political bias or other improper considerations besides what we just talked about? Um, prior to July 5, the specific investigation, investigative decisions we looked at, we did not find evidence, testimony or documentary evidence that they were the subject of improper considerations, including political bias. Did your report find that senior Justice Department leadership, including then Attorney General Lynch and Deputy Attorney General Yates, had a limited role in the investigation um, and instead appropriately relied on career staff rather than political appointees? We do describe here their limited involvement prior to July 5 in the day-to-day -day operations of the investigation. Those are great. Could I just ask one more question? Uh, if you do it quickly. Did you find that the department's decision making in this case was consistent with its approach in other circumstances in terms of investigation? We found the prosecutors described to us their process and that, in fact, that is what they based their decisions on. Thank you. Senator Graham. Would you say that this investigation was done by the book? Um, Hard to say what by the book. Well, who is, wrote this but, book? Um, <laughs> done by the book. Who wrote the, it? Um, I think there are reasons to raise questions on it, certain it, of these it, steps. I, don't mean, I think you did a good job, but the whole idea no. that this is normal, folks, there's nothing here normal. I don't want you to think the FBI does this day in and day out. This is not normal. And I think that's what you tried to find. Yeah. Do you believe it's pretty clear to everybody in the country by July the 5th that Donald Trump was the presumptive nominee of the Republican Party? That's my recollection. Um, and from well, the text, it's pretty clear. Yeah. Right. And the texts, I think, reflect that as well. Okay, I'm going to read this uh, text message from uh, Paige to Strzok on August the 8th, after he'd gotten the nomination. She says, Trump's not ever going to become president, right? Right? Strzok responded, no, no, he's not. We'll stop it. I don't know how you feel about that. That's pretty unnerving. Strzok, wasn't he the lead investigator of the Clinton email investigation? Um, he was, in essence, the lead investigator. Okay, so the head guy looking at Clinton on August the 8th says, we got to stop Trump. Now, did, was that just idle talk? A week later, here's what they say to each other. Strzok text message to Lisa Page. I want to believe the path you threw out for consideration in Andy's office that there's no way he gets elected, but I'm afraid we can't take that risk. It's like an insurance policy in the unlikely event you die before you're 40. Now that's a week later. Who's Andy? Uh, our understanding it was Andy McCabe, the deputy director. So you got the deputy director meeting with the lead investigator of the Clinton email investigation and Miss Page, who's involved somehow, meeting in Andy's office, discussing, taking out an insurance policy to make sure Donald Trump doesn't become president. Did you, is that what you're telling us? Um, I, I'll be clear. I can't speak to whether McCabe, Mr. McCabe was there or not. Did you ask Mr. McCabe? We, uh, we did. He said he was not, he did not recall. So one of them's lying. So, so I want you to reopen this investigation and come back and tell us, do you believe Strzok? Or do you believe McKay? Because you just told me the deputy director of the FBI says he's not the Andy. Oh, he don't. Just to be clear, it, they're talking about what a, a conversation in his office. Yeah. He's claiming he is stating he does not recall whether he was there or not, 
and well, neither of those individuals are putting him in the middle of their conversation. All I'm saying is at the Andy's office where this occurred, he wasn't there. What did Strzok, did Strzok say he was there? Strzok says he was there. Well, somebody's lying. So anyway, we'll figure that out later. None of this is normal, folks. Uh, let's, let's look at the actual interview itself. Uh, how many people were involved in the Clinton interview on July the 2nd? Uh, there were, um, I believe, six or eight people present, but two agents conducting the interview. So as I understand it, there were two agents and two prosecutors. Correct. Okay. Now, this was an email sent in February 2016 from Paige to McCabe. Mm -hmm. Hey, you've surely already considered this. But in my view, our best reason to hold the line at two and two, two agents and two prosecutors, is she might be our next president. How did you feel about that? We were concerned about it, and we lay it out, lay out here why we were. OK, concerned. let's keep talking about this interview. One of the FBI agents in the interview said on Election Day to another FBI agent, you should know that I'm with her. Now, her was Clinton, right? Correct. How do you feel about that? Very concerned. Okay. Eventually, very concerned gets to be enough already. Mm -hmm. I'm very concerned. You know, I'm one, I'm glad I don't text an email. <laughs> That's one thing I'm glad I don't do. But circumstance, have you ever proved the case by circumstantial evidence, Director Ray? Yes. Well, I'm going to write you a letter and talk about why you should reconsider your findings as to whether or not it affected the investigation. Here's what Ms. Page, Mr. Ms. Page said on March the 4th, 2016. God, Trump is a loath, loath, loathsome human. How do you feel about that? I mean, she's entitled to her opinion. I think we've laid out here why we were so concerned about it. Well, when you add it all up, as early as March, these people hated Trump, and this investigation was anything but by the book. And at the end of the day, what Comey did just blows me away as much as it does y'all. And I can't believe that this happened to my FBI. I told you the story, Mr. Ray, uh, Director Ray, about wanting to be part of the organization, and y'all were smart enough not to take me. The bottom line is, if you're on our side of the aisle, this really does hit you hard. And we can't just write it off. I think there was a lot of bias that did affect an investigation that is, to me, almost impossible to explain using any standard that I grew up with as a prosecutor or even as a defense attorney. This is struck the page on October the 20th. Trump is an effing idiot. Bottom line is, I'm glad you found what you found, Mr. Horwitz. I'm not buying that the Clinton email investigation was on the up and up. And the reason I'm not buying it is because the two people intimately involved, one, the guy, the, the lead investigator, clearly did not want to see Donald Trump become president of the United States. Finally, do you agree with me that finding her liable criminally would be inconsistent with stopping Donald Trump. If they found Hillary Clinton was criminally liable, that paves the way for Donald Trump. I, Can you I, put those two things together? I, I guess it would depend when, but yes, I could How about conceivably July, it could. Or the convention. Oh, cl it clearly could conceivably. Well, not only clearly conceivably, that's exactly what's happening here, folks. You cannot hold her criminally liable and stop him. As to the law, why did they change gross negligence in the original statement, Director Ray, to reckless disregard? I, I think I would defer to the Inspector General who looked into that. Why did they do that? Um, it the, the explanation was that... Can I just suggest something? Yeah. Gross negligence is a criminally liable standard. Correct. So if they had said it the way they originally wrote it, she's guilty of a crime and the reason they changed it is because she's not guilty of a crime and if you want to stop him it can't be gross negligence what's the difference between reckless disregard and gross negligence uh not much 
it's a it lot politically. Much, right. Thank you. Uh, Senator Coons would be next, so I guess we'll go with Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, I can't let this afternoon pass, Director Ray, without saying to you how grateful we should all be for the men and women who work for you, who put their lives on the line, whose integrity and dedication to our nation are in no way affected by anything in this report. And I still have on my wall my seal from the Department of Justice of decades ago when I was United States Attorney, and I know that the men and women of the FBI work hard every day to uphold those ideals, and I want to thank you for your response, which is to make the FBI even better and avoid any repetition of a small number of agents and attorneys casting a cloud on the integrity of the FBI. So thank you for your response so far. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Director Harwoods, if I were President Trump and I held up this document to you and I said, sitting here right now, this report totally exonerates me. It shows no collusion, no obstruction of justice. What would you say to me? Um, Senator, I'd answer as I did before, which is our the report covers the mid-year investigation. It touches on the Russia investigation in uh, connection with the Wiener laptop matter, and um, that's what this was concerning. And I want to thank you for the work on this report, and I respect your basically avoiding my question. I know that you're playing by norms and rules that apply to the Department of Justice, but you're dealing with the President of the United States that has no respect for those norms and rules. And he is distorting this report. He is weaponizing it to discredit the special counsel and to really undermine the rule of law in the United States of America. And he's using your report to do it. So I would just respectfully suggest that all of us have a responsibility to state the truth and speak that truth to power, which in this case happens to be one of the most powerful men on earth when he lies about it because it gravely threatens the rule of law. And I know you're playing by the rules, but he isn't. Let me ask you, uh, Director Ray, um, the effect of these leaks from the New York office to Rudolph Giuliani was the subject of a letter that I wrote to you on May 8th. I don't know whether you have seen it or have it in mind. Uh, basically, it asks you what is being done to assure there are no continuing unauthorized disclosures to Rudolph Giuliani, who now, just to state the elephant in the room, is the president's lawyer. Can you assure the American people that there are no ongoing leaks from any office of the FBI to Rudolph Giuliani? Well, Senator, I'm certainly not aware of any. Uh, we are aggressively investigating a number of leaks, even as we speak. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have a dedicated unit that I stood up to focus on that. We have a new media policy that makes the rules unmistakably clear to everyone in every office. We have a disciplinary arm that is well regarded as being one of the toughest but fairest out there. And we intend to use all those things to make sure that everybody in every office follows the rules regarding leaks. Well, if if you would, I would appreciate a response to the letter, you have received none yet, that provides some more specific assurance that there are no ongoing leaks because these leaks had a very practical effect. And we state the timeline in the letter. Rudolph Giuliani said on October 26, 2016, that he expected a surprise in the next few days. Two days later, Director Comey issued his letter. And he did it in large part, and I'm quoting his general counsel, because they felt it would leak. Those emails would leak if he didn't write the letter. And then Rudolph Giuliani said, 
when asked about whether or not he knew about the letter, you're darn right, I did. So the practical effect on Director Comey's decision to do that letter was very, very tangible. I want to uh, go to uh, another impact of the leaks and ask you about them. We now know that Mr. Giuliani was not the only recipient of leaks designed to hurt Hillary Clinton. Representative Nunes recently admitted that FBI personnel secretly informed him in September of 2016 when Clinton emails were found on Anthony Weiner's laptop. He's admitted that fact. And they did it just days after the emails were discovered. So there was a leak to him. The timing and contact of this disclosure strongly suggests that the goal was, in fact, of this FBI leaker to give an outspoken Trump ally politically sensitive and highly secret information to use for political purposes. Representative Nunes appears to have recognized this fact because he never told any of his Democratic colleagues on the Intelligence Committee about it. Can you assure us that there are no ongoing leaks or unauthorized disclosure to Representative Nunes or anyone else in the House Intelligence Committee? Well, Senator, again, I'm not, as I said uh, before, I'm not aware of any ongoing leaks to uh, any member of Congress or to the media. And you would uh, I find that. all. I would absolutely, if I was aware of a leak, I would take uh, appropriate action. Um, I, I don't want to cast dispersions on the New York field office, which I think is one of our best offices. Uh, but I don't condone leaks anywhere to anyone, and I don't really care what the motivation is, no matter how, how altruistic it might be. Leaks are wrong, and we need to be tough on them. And I want to join you in the respect that I share for the New York field office, and as I stated earlier, for the FBI. Generally, uh, General Horowitz, the comments that we have all said are unacceptable and abhorrent from Peter Stroke and Lisa Page were not the only inappropriate texts. In fact, uh, there were comments that were disparaging about Hillary Clinton, were there not, that you found in your report. We have put in there other examples of texts, including other individuals beyond. In fact, there were slurs by FBI agents against Hillary Clinton, one saying, for example, that uh, urged colleagues in the FBI to continue investigating Clinton to, quote, get that, I'm not going to articulate the word here, but there were slurs against her from other FBI agents. I, I think that recounts what the general counsel said he had heard. So I don't think that's from these text messages. It's not a direct quote, clear. but it is something that was heard. That was something the general counsel relayed, the FBI general counsel relayed to us. Senator okay. Grable. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I want to go first to, to you, Mr. Horowitz. A lot of discussion has gone on back and forth here about whether bias has been found and what that bias was. Uh, you have indicated that your report does not have, has not found documentary or oral testimony or evidence showing bias in the charging decisions. Is that correct? How would you put it? Yes. So, in the, as to the charging decisions, we did. That's correct because they were made by the prosecutors, not the individuals, obviously, who were the agents, um, find, uh, whose texts we were concerned about. And in addition, as to the specific investigative decisions we looked at, we also made clear we didn't look at all the decisions in the report. Um, and I'll add, when we got to October, we had concerns that there may be bias impacting the decision to prioritize the Russia investigation. So, over what, so what you're talking about is what prosecutors did correct. with the report. You're not talking about whether there was bias in the recommendation not to prosecute, are correct? You? And you're not saying you didn't find bias. Uh, well, for example, in the emails we've been having a lot of discussion about here. I, I think it's clear from certainly the email, the text messages we've talked about with regard to Mr. Strzok that he had, as we say, or a biased state of mind. And as I understand from reading the the report, uh, not only Mr. Strzok but a number of those who you found concerning comments being made by uh, expressed remorse, 
uh, said uh, that they intended for these to be private conversations and then said that it didn't have anything to do with the way that they did their job. Is that, is that correct? That was their explanations. And what you're telling us is that you don't have any different evidence than that. You're not saying you believe it or not. You're saying that you don't have different evidence. Correct. Um, I think that's a lot different than saying there's no bias.
And uh, was the report completed then? I, I think you said this, but I'd like to clarification. Was your report completed or was there any draft disclosed to any agency outside of your IG's office before or on June 5th of 2018? So following again our normal practice, as we do in every report and as we did in this report, we provide a draft copy of it to the department and again, in this case, the FBI to review, uh, and this was in mid-May, to review and to provide us um, with what we call a, um, a review to determine whether there's, for example, grand jury, Title III, other information in it, classified information that would be inappropriate to be public. In fact, in this case, there was, and at our request, the department went to court, we got unsealing orders, so that what you see here is unredacted and full. When you shared that information in May, did it include your findings? It includes our full draft. And to the question asked earlier, um, did anybody pressure us to make changes that softened, weakened, changed the findings? We were not pressured in any way to do that. We were followed our usual practice. Were you requested to change the findings? In we are asked the team by people that are commented in here and others to uh, Let's talk about this case, if you don't mind. I am talking about yeah. this case. We allow individuals as well to look at this. Did anyone in the White House ask you to change? We have no <laughs> communications at all with them. And then, uh, Director Ray, you've talked, uh, many of us have talked about uh, the duties and responsibilities and ethics of a prosecutor. I appreciate that you are enjoying not uh, being a practicing lawyer anymore. But I'd, I'd like to ask you, um, the report aptly notes that, quote, criticizing individuals for conduct that does not warrant prosecution is something that the department simply does not do. As a former prosecutor, as a citizen, as the director of the FBI, uh, do you agree that when um, Director Comey concluded that Secretary Clinton's conduct did not amount to a prosecutable, prosecutable offense, that he should have refrained from making any public critique or commentary? <laughs> Well, Senator, as I said earlier, uh, I think the policies the department has uh, governing commenting publicly about uncharged conduct uh, are there for a good reason. In addition to having been a prosecutor, a line prosecutor, uh, you know, the head of the criminal division, I've also been a defense attorney. So I've also had clients that are impacted by those policies and norms. And I think those policies and norms are there for a reason. Uh, and I would expect to follow them. And I appreciate the point you made earlier about the, um, the new policies that you've put in, in place. And I join uh, the comments made by many of my colleagues in, in praising and thanking the men and women of your agency for the work that they do. And much of that work has happened with local law enforcement in California. And on behalf of them, I thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, you also mentioned a number of, and the report mentions a number of recommendations. So, Director Ray, I'm just going to ask you for the record if you'll commit to uh, one, enforcing the policy that prohibits the department and its employees from publicly discussing the conduct of uncharged individuals. Yes, that's part of our remedial action in response to this. And uh, will you also commit to enforcing the Department of Justice policy that explicitly prohibits the department and its employees from taking investigative steps? that could impact an election? Well, I think we would follow department policy on that, and I would expect our, our folks to. My understanding from the Inspector General's report is that there may be room for the department to be a little more clear about exactly what that policy is. There is a pretty long-standing norm yep. that applies to it, but whether the policies themselves are clear enough, I think is up to debate, and I think we would work with the department and follow whatever the policy is. Thank you. And then if you could follow up with the committee, um, that would be great. Thank Senator, you. Nothing else. Senator Kennedy. General, a um, couple of brief questions first. Can we agree that the FBI is uh, the premier law enforcement agency in the history of ever? I, I will say one of them since I oversee multiple. Can we agree that the FBI has about 37,000 employees? Yes. 
can we agree that there were and perhaps still are a small minority of bad apples at the FBI? I think in any large organization, you're going to find problems. Can we agree that Director Ray has the will, uh, ability, and authority to find out, find those bad apples and terminate their employment with extreme prejudice? Um, yes, and we work closely with Director Ray and have a very good relationship. And refer them to for prosecution if necessary. That's correct. Or to the IG for investigation. Can we agree that Mr. Comey, would, while he was FBI director, was intentionally subordinate? Yes. Can we agree that insubordination, particularly intentional insubordination, it can be a symptom of managerial bias? It could be. Did you find that Mr. Comey was unbiased or biased and, and it did not act on his bias? We found no evidence that he was politically biased. That was what we were looking at and asked to look at in the requests we got. Can we agree that bias is a state of mind? Yes. Can we agree that the only person who truly knows that person's state of mind is that person unless he's insane? Yes, or memorializes it or tells somebody about it in some way. Did you find any indication that Mr. Comey was or is insane? Uh, no, we did not. Okay, are you referring uh, Mr. Comey?